Hey everybody, welcome to our next knowledge quest in the Windows Server 2012 Early Experts Challenge, the program that helps you study and prepare for the new Windows Server 2012 Microsoft Certification Exams. In this video, we'll be introducing you to the Explorer Quest, which is our next online knowledge quest in the Early Experts series to help you prepare for the group policy and server management exam objective domains in exam 70-410, the install and config exam for Windows Server 2012. My name is Keith Mayer. I'm an IT Pro technical evangelist at Microsoft. I've been an IT Pro for over 17 years. I've had to take a lot of certification exams across that time. And I'm happy to provide this program to you to help extend you to you the study materials that I found personally valuable as I progressed through the 70-410, 70-411, and 70-412 Windows Server 2012 certification exams. I've got a lot of experience on both sides of the desk supporting Windows Server environments both as a network engineer and IT manager inside many organizations over my career, as well as as a consultant and trainer. I've trained and consulted thousands of IT pros worldwide across the uh, over the years across many different Microsoft and uh, networking technologies. I'm also the author of some resources that you may find helpful out on Microsoft TechNet. I manage the IT Pros Rock blog. You can access that blog easily just by going to keithmayer.com in your web browser. And I'm also one of the authors in our Early Experts Challenge that provides certification study guide material at earlyexperts.net. As we go through our introduction to the Explorer Quest, we've got lots of material to cover, but your questions are certainly very important, and we wanted to make sure that you knew how to submit questions to the Early Experts community. So you can submit those questions via Twitter using the Early Experts hashtag. You can also submit those questions on LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn community group for the Early Experts program that you can join by browsing out to join.earlyexperts.net. Either Twitter or LinkedIn are great ways of keeping in touch with all of the other IT pros that are also going through this program, sharing study tips, posting questions, helping each other out as we're all targeting preparation for the new Windows Server 2012 certification exams. If you, in addition, if you have questions that are more programmatic in nature to the Early Experts Challenge program, perhaps relating to some of the study materials themselves or to the certificates of completion at the end of each knowledge quest. You can also feel free to email our team at earlyexperts at microsoft.com. For those of you that have not started on the Early Experts Challenge yet, the Early Experts Challenge is a series of online knowledge quests that are released on a monthly basis each knowledge quest targets a particular Windows Server certification exam and set of exam objectives. And when you complete each knowledge quest, you'll be eligible to receive a customized certificate of completion that you can post online and share with your own social media networks, or you can print and display in your office as an example of your newfound knowledge on Windows Server 2012. Our ultimate goal is to help you prepare for certification exams surrounding the MCSA certification on Windows Server 2012. But along the way, I think you'll agree that through our video-based lectures, our structured study resources, and our hands-on lab activities, you'll also gain real-world knowledge on how to leverage the new features of Server 2012 in your own organization. Now, for the first five knowledge quests in the Early Experts Challenge, we're specifically targeting exam 70-410, the install and config exam. That's the first exam in a three exam series for those that are new to Microsoft certification for achieving the MCSA credential on Windows Server 2012. When we come back in the January timeframe, we'll be targeting 70-411, in Jan January, February, and March, and then exam 412 in the April, May, and June timeframes of 2013. So over the next 12 months, we'll be releasing study materials to help you walk through preparing for all three of these exams 
to hopefully achieve your MCSA on Windows Server 2012. Now, if you already have one of the upgradable certifications listed at the bottom of my slide, then you qualify for a single exam path to the MCSA on Windows Server 2012, Exam 417. The Exam 417 has a subset of the exam objective domains from the top three exams. It's focused just on what's new with Windows Server 2012 for people that already had experience with Windows Server 2008 and 2008 R2. As we go through the study, the preparation of each knowledge quest and the study process, we'll be sure to note which study guides are appropriate for both the new to Microsoft certification track as well as the upgrade certification track. For instance, last month with our installer quest, those exam objectives were common to both exam 70-410 as well as exam 70-417. This month with the Explorer Quest, the exam objectives that we'll be targeting are not covered in exam 417. They are specific to exam 70-410. Certainly you can find more detail on all of the Microsoft certification exams by browsing out to the URL that I have listed at the bottom of my slide. So last month, those of you that enrolled in the program went through the installer quest. Now, if you haven't completed the installer quest yet, that there's no problem at all. You, the materials are still available online. You can still browse out to aka.ms, Early Experts Installer, and be able to complete that material on your own pace. Um, that's quite fine. In the installer quest, for those that went through that last month, you went through the process of installing and configuring servers with the full GUI interface, as well as with the server core, command line only interface, and the new minimal server interface that provides a server core experience, but also adds the ability to launch MMC-based graphical tools. After the install and config of servers, you also walk through configuring NIC teaming with our new integrated support for NIC teams, you walk through building out local storage using our new storage pools, virtual disks, and thin, provision, thin provisioning capabilities around storage in Server 2012. And then you installed Active Directory using the new simplified installation process for setting up an Active Directory forest, domain, and domain controller in your environment. As you went through the installer quest, there were some common questions that were posted to our LinkedIn community group. For NIC teaming, some of you mentioned that when you were building your NIC teams, you lost network connectivity if you were remotely connected into your study lab environment. The, uh, the issue around that is you may have accidentally included inside your NIC team the network interface that you are physically trying to remote into your study lab environment through. In the lab, we built out some test adapters that were used to build, that were intended for use in building the NIC team. Those test adapters used a special loopback driver and were presented as sort of a fake or synthetic NIC to our Windows Server study labs so that we could build NIC teams with those loopback adapters, those test adapters, instead of risking building a NIC team with our main adapter that we we're remoted in through. So to give you just a quick example of how those loopback adapters were installed, I'm just going to switch over into my study lab environment. Here I've got server manager. From the server manager tool, I'll pull down my tools menu and drop down to computer management. Inside computer management in the lab, we went through device manager and we added in several network adapters that were using loopback adapters. In the lab you added two of those in. I've actually got four loopback adapters installed as separate network interfaces. These loopback adapters are then the adapters that you want to use for building out your NIC team in the lab. And you can see which network interfaces are using these loopback adapters just by dropping over into your network and sharing center and taking a look at your adapter settings. For each adapter that you have in your network connections control panel applet, you'll see the driver that's being used. And what we'd want to do then is identify the particular drivers that are the particular Ethernet network interfaces that are 
being used with our loopback adapters, those are the interfaces that we want to build our NIC team in the lab with. That way we don't have to worry about disrupting any remote access into our study lab environment. So in this case I've got Ethernet 3, Ethernet 4, Ethernet 5 and 6 that are all using the loopback adapter. If I go ahead and close down some of these tools and go back over to Server Manager under the local server page I can click on my NIC teaming tool and select just those loopback adapters to create a new team with. So I would select those adapters, add to a new team, and that way I'd be creating a team with those test loopback adapters instead of creating it over the primary network connection that I'm remoted in to my server with. The second area that some questions came up around was in our storage spaces lab. For storage spaces, we were using virtual hard disks to represent physical hard disks in the lab so that we didn't have to man we didn't have to physically add new hard disk devices to our study lab computers in order to take advantage of playing around with storage spaces. What some of you noticed is that after rebooting your study lab servers, your virtual hard disks disappeared and that's because we were mounting those virtual hard disks using disk management, the disk management tool. Anytime you mount those, if you reboot your server, you do have to manually reattach those virtual hard disks in the disk management tool. So if we go up back into server manager, go to our tools menu, pop back into computer management and navigate over to the disk management tool, we'll see that uh, from the actions menu in our disk management tool we can reattach all of those virtual hard disks by browsing out to them and clicking OK on each of them. Once they're reattached we'll see those particular virtual hard disks reappear in disk management after rebooting and then we'll be able to go back into our file and storage services into our storage pools area and be able to select the server that we're on and see the physical disk devices that that server is displaying. And so here we have our server that we're currently on in our study group environment and then there's the three additional disks that we can now select. Right click and use as the basis of a new storage pool. So that's all there is to that particular piece. The third question that arose was in terms of the Active Directory Lab. Many of you went through the Active Directory Lab and built out your new Active Directory Forest and Domain and Domain Controller on your Study Lab computer. And as part of that process, you saw that the Active Directory Domain Services installation also made your new Domain Controller a, an Active Directory integrated DNS server. Well, many of you wanted to take the next step of joining a client to your new Active Directory domain. And although that wasn't configured in, that wasn't specifically called out in the lab, that's great that you wanted to take that extra step. Um, however, because we didn't have DHCP configured in our environment yet, we didn't have a vehicle for leasing out the new DNS server IP address of our Active Directory domain controller to our client that we were trying to attach to Active Directory. And so you may have run into some problems where your client couldn't find your new Active Directory domain. In order to resolve that in our study lab environment, all we need to do is drop back over to our client and on our client we would go into our network settings. So I'm just going to open up the network settings on my server and go to the network connections. On our client we'd obviously have just one or two network interfaces and we'd pick one of those interfaces on our client, drop into properties and in the IP settings we would keep our obtain an IP address automatically selected if we were using DHCP from another source to provide us with an IP address, but we'd specify under DNS server addresses to use the following DNS server address and then type in the IP address that we can send our DNS requests to. That would be in this case the IP address of our new Active Directory domain controller that's built in our study lab environment. Once we've saved those settings we can then reboot our machine, 
join the Active Directory domain, we should be all set to go at that point. And again, if you're into any, any other questions, you can feel free to submit those questions in our LinkedIn community group at join.earlyexperts.net or out on Twitter using the Early Experts hashtag. Now let's talk about what we'll be covering in this month's Knowledge Quest in the Explorer Quest. In the Explorer Quest, we'll be targeting the Create and Manage Group Policy objective domain and the Configure Server Roles and Features objective domain that's associated with Exam 70-410, the Installing and Configuring Windows Server 2012 exam. We'll be dividing our study materials across four weeks into three separate study guides. Those study guides are accessible using the URL on our slide, aka.ms forward slash early experts explorer. In weeks one and two, our recommendation is to divide the first study guide on group policy between those two weeks. It's a fairly in-depth study guide with a few different videos and some great study resources as well as hands-on lab exercises. In week three, you'll be going into the second study guide, Managing Servers, Server Roles and Features with Server Manager. And in week four, you'll be stepping through Managing Servers with PowerShell 3.0, the new PowerShell command line uh, interface for Windows Server 2012. So let's take a quick tour through each of these areas to give you a preview of what you'll be targeting in each of the study guides. So when we think about what's new in group policy for Windows Server 2012, we've got several areas that have been updated. We've got some new starter GPOs. We've got some great remote capabilities now for forcing remote group policy updates and uh, group policy reports remo uh, remotely. We've also got some improvements to our results reports and to the infrastructure and a new infrastructure status report. And then we've got some enhanced support for some Windows 8 features if you're starting to run Windows 8 clients in your environment around Windows 8's fast startup feature, some login optimizations, and then some new group policy settings for configuring the new user interface and advanced features that are present in Windows 8. If we take a look at each of these areas, let's start off with the new starter GPOs. So in Windows Server 2012, there's two new starter GPOs that can be used for building group policy objects. These two new starter GPOs are GPOs that allow us to easily update Windows firewall settings on our clients within our domain to be able to take advantage of the new group policy re reporting and remote update features. They can be deployed via Group Policy Management Console or they can be deployed via PowerShell using the new GPO and new GP Link PowerShell commandlets. If we drop over into our lab environment, let's take a look at deploying these starter GPOs using the Group Policy Management Console. So in Server Manager, I would launch the Group Policy Management Console from my Tools menu. I'll go ahead and click on that, and the Group Policy Management Console will launch. If I expand out my Domains area, we'll see the Starter GPOs container. And here's at the top of the list my two new starter GPOs for being able to remotely configure Windows Firewall through Group Policy to support Group Policy Remote Update and the new Group Policy Reporting features. In order to create new Group Policy objects with either using either of these new starter GPOs, I can just right click on my domain, create a new GPO specify a name for my G new GPO, and then select the appropriate starter GPO to create my new group policy object with. So in this case, I could select the remote update firewall ports, create one new GPO using that starter GPO to update those Windows firewall ports on my clients throughout my domain, and then create a second GPO using the reporting firewall ports uh, starter GPO for updating those Windows firewall ports. So pretty, uh, pretty easy to step through that process. Once those new group policy objects are deployed and have been processed by clients within my domain, I can then take advantage of those new remote and reporting group policy features. 
the remote feature that's available to me now is invoking either through the group policy management console or through PowerShell a remote group policy update. This way when I'm when I'm building new group policy objects if I want them to take effect immediately or I just want to test those group policy objects on a set of computers I can force a remote GP update using either of these tools either for individual computer objects within my Active Directory domain environment or for an entire organizational unit of computer objects within Active Directory. To see how this works I'll pop back into my lab environment where we've got the group policy management console running. If I wanted to use the group policy management console to force a remote update I could just right click on one of my organizational units and then select the group policy update action. When I select that action it'll show me how many computer objects are within that container and allow me to confirm that I want to force a group policy update on each of them. If I just want to force a group policy update on a single computer object, I can manually run the invoke GP update PowerShell commandlet. Now in this case, I have invoke GP update in the example on my slide packaged inside of a uh, nested inside of a larger script block that's allowing me to first retrieve a list of appropriate Active Directory computer objects using git ad computer, in this case a list out of my accounting OU, and then piping that list into a for each object script block that runs an invoke GP update for each of those computers. Now I could certainly do this to force an update from the command prompt or within a script of all an entire OU for, uh, for full, of, full of computer objects or I could run just the invoke GP update commandlet by itself to do some testing and force on one or two computer objects a GP update remotely. We also have some improvements in the group policy results report. We have some new information that's available in the GPMC results report that helps us troubleshoot group policy applications and identify why perhaps certain group policy settings maybe aren't coming down to a particular client or set of clients. Some of the new information available in the results report includes whether a client's connection to Active Directory was determined to be a slow link or fast link so we can determine maybe group policy is being applied asynchronously across a slow link instead of synchronously across a fast link. We can also see whether blue block inheritance or loopback has been set. We can see the processing time for each client side extension. So if it looks like it's taking a long time to process group policies, we can try to figure out which component of group policy is spending the most time and analyze that further. And we can also see for each policy setting or preference item that's delivered down via group policy objects to a client, we can see what the winning group policy object, the winning GPO was that delivered each of those settings so that if we have multiple GPOs in our environment setting the same policy settings or preference items to different values for different collections of clients we can see what's ultimately effective on a client by client basis and we can see which GPO has applied those settings to the client. Now we can run this report through the Group Policy Management Console just like we did in the past. We can also now run the GP results report locally from a client by launching the GP result exe command line tool with the forward slash h switch and then specify the path to a HTML file that we wish to have the report generated inside. So it'll create that file with the report inside of it. Now to see how this report works I'll uh, just go back into my lab environment here and if we wanted to run a new group policy results report we can simply in GPMC navigate down to our group policy results node right click and step through the group policy results wizard. The wizard will allow us to select a particular computer either the computer that we're on or another computer within our Active Directory domain to be used to analyze what the resultant set of policies that are delivered to that uh, computer and to the user on that computer will be. So we'll say select this computer. We can also select a particular user to analyze for user 
assigned policies, so I'll select my current user. Once we've done that, we click Next and Finish. It'll create a new report in our GP results container that shows us the details associated with the processing of group policy objects that are assigned to this computer that's been selected and this user. So on the summary tab, it'll show us that a fast link was detected. We didn't have a slow link detected. Um, and that there was a particular error detected um, in processing the last uh, computer policy. So we can drill through and see the exact event details of that error to further troubleshoot the problem very easily. We can also go over to our details tab and show each of the processing times of each of the components, each of the client-side extensions, and then where we see our biggest processing time, we can drop in and view the log and step through the process of what that component has been doing to further troubleshoot that lengthy processing time that might be occurring in just one area. For each of the policy settings or preference settings that are delivered down, we can also expand out those particular areas and be able to see for each area what group policy object was delivering those particular settings. So we can see the name of the setting, a description of the setting, what the values of those settings are, and then under winning GPO we can see which GPO has delivered that setting down so that there's, so that there's no guesswork involved in figuring out which group policy object in every case has delivered a particular setting down to this computer. So some really nice features in the group policy results report for being able to better troubleshoot the application of group policies across clients in a large Active Directory domain environment. Now there is also a another um, reporting area that's been enhanced. We now have a new group policy infrastructure status report as well that's available within the group policy management console. The group policy infrastructure status report is designed to roll through all of your domain controllers and do a comparison of the group policy objects and the template files to look for differences in terms of security settings in the access control list of those objects or files, version number differences, or counts. It'll also, for your template files, look at file hashing for each file to see if there's any differences inside those files. The intent there is to try to look for discrepancies where when your Active Directory domain controllers are replicating group policies, it's intended to make sure that is everything replicating properly or are there certain components either at a security level, at an object level, or at a file level in group policy that are being prevented from replicating properly for one reason or another. In order to use this new infrastructure status report, we would just um, navigate back to our group policy management console and either at a domain level or at a particular group policy level if we um, go through the process of selecting our domain. So I'll go ahead and select my domain. On the status tab we can refresh the infrastructure status report by clicking on the detect now button. And so here we have the report and in this case I only have one domain controller but it would, if I had multiple domain controllers, allow me to expand out each of the areas and determine what replication may be already in progress, which domain controllers are completely in sync, and then any issues that may exist across any of those areas that we looked at in the Group Policy Infrastructure Status Report. Now, in terms of group policy processing, there's also some considerations when deploying Windows 8 clients within your environment. Windows 8 has by default a new feature enabled called Fast Startup that's intended to decrease the time required to shut down and start up Windows 8 PCs by leveraging hibernation of the kernel of Windows 8. So when you normally have users that shut down or start up a Windows 8 PC, by default all the user mode applications are closed down during shutdown, but the kernel itself is actually hibernated to your hyperfile.sys that's normally located as a hidden file in the root of your C folder. That way when starting up a Windows 8 machine, instead of having to reload and reinitialize the kernel completely from ground zero, it instead only has to unhibernate the kernel 
and then launch the new user mode components and device drivers after that. It makes starting up and shutting down Windows 8 machines very quick, requiring just a few seconds, but it does present some challenges when it comes to group policy processing because you may have group policy settings or scripts that have been targeted for computer startup or shutdown as the triggers to apply. If you're using fast startup in Windows 8, the normal shutdown and startup process doesn't process your group policies because it doesn't completely shut down or start up. It instead uses that kernel hibernation feature. In order to ensure that your startup or shutdown group policy settings and scripts are applied, you can force users to restart their machines. Well, upon a restart, that does do a full shutdown and a full startup and will ensure that all of the group policies selected for shutdown and startup do apply. You also have the ability, if you'd prefer, to disable fast startup in your environment. You can do that through group policy and uh, and avoid the, the, the challenges with fast startup. However, it will take longer to boot up into Windows 8 if fast startup is disabled. In addition, there's some new sign-in optimizations that have been made in Windows 8 that, um, that uh, occur with some of the new types of network connections that Windows 8 can log in across and, and slow, slow link detection. First, for direct access connections, Windows 8 will treat all direct access connections as slow links. It'll also, it can also be configured to treat all uh, 3G or 4G connections wireless WAN connections as slow links as well. And then for any slow links that are detected, group policy objects would be processed asynchronously instead of synchronously so that they don't slow down the logon process. What you may see then is if you're using direct access or if you're using 3G and 4G connections and you've tagged them to be treated as slow links, you may see that it takes certain group policy settings or group policy preference items two times to apply on user login. So it may, it may take two user logins for them to apply because since the group policy settings are being applied asynchronously, they may apply after the first login is completed and it may require a second log out and log back in for them to really take effect on the operating system. In addition to fast startup and sign-in optimizations, Windows Server 2012 also includes over 350 new settings for managing different aspects of Windows 8 clients in your environment. That brings the number of total policy settings to over 3,600 total policy settings. You can configure and customize the Windows 8 style start screen and lock screen. You can customize which portions of a user's environment in Windows 8 syncs over to their Microsoft SkyDrive if you're leaving the ability to authenticate to their Microsoft account turned on. You also have a cool feature around folder redirection and user profile roaming where you can now use a group policy to specify that those settings only take place when the user's at one of their primary computers. That's a pretty cool setting as well. You can manage installation of Windows 8 style apps with, that you may have developed internally. You also have the ability to configure how the Windows Store behaves with Windows 8 through group policy. You can set up wireless WAN cost policies for wireless Wi-Fi connections, for 3G connections, for 4G networks, so that they can be treated as slow links, as we mentioned on the pre previous slide. You've got the ability to customize pretty much every aspect of the new Internet Explorer, the new IE10, and you can also remotely configure through group policy your PowerShell execution policies. So if you require certain policies for running PowerShell scripts in your environment, you can configure those execution policies via, via group policy now. The group policy settings that are new are contained in a new reference workbook and in the study plan for group policy you'll find a link to that new reference workbook. It's a, a great resource to have for being able to walk through all of the new group policy settings. And here I have an example of that group policy settings reference workbook. You'll notice that there's a few tabs in the workbook. Most of the new settings are made inside the administrative templates. And on that tab, we have a few columns 
that allow us to very easily locate the new settings. We can filter on the status column and just pick, pick out the new settings that Windows Server 2012 includes for Windows 8, for instance. We can also filter on the particular template, group policy template. So if we wanted to focus in just on changes around the um, folder redirection template, for instance, we could pick that one and see just the settings that are new for folder redirection. And so there's one of the settings that we talked about just a few moments ago in terms of being able to redirect folders only when a user's on their primary computer or one of their primary computers if they have multiple. So very great, very uh, easy to use, very great resource to use for being able to easily locate all of the new group policy settings for each setting. Not only is the policy setting and template given, but also as you scroll across, it gives the path of where to find those policies in the group policy editor. It gives the registry information of where that group policy is storing its information in the registry. It also provides which minimum operating system releases are supported for these new group policy settings. And it gives additional help text that gives you more details about what this group policy setting provides as well as any specific requirements. So if there's any requirements that the Active Directory schema be extended, for instance, for, um, for this group policy setting, that'll be noted in the help text as well. So some good information on group policy in this reference workbook. And that brings us to what's new in Server Manager. So Server Manager, as some of you may have seen already, has been completely rewritten in Windows Server 2012 to act as a multi-server remote management dashboard for physical servers, remote servers, whether they're in your data center or whether they're in the cloud. You can add multiple servers, up to 100 servers, into the server management dashboard and you have a, a fair bit of customization that you can do to customize how information is reported and rolled up to give you at-a-glance health information as well as customizing how the more detailed information is collected and displayed across your various servers. So I'm just going to pop back into my lab environment here so that we can take a, a peek at Server Manager for a moment. And I'll close down our Group Policy Management Console. And we'll go back to the Server Management Dashboard. So the Server Manager Dashboard gives us a snapshot view of all of the important roles or groups of servers in our environment. It shows us how many servers are in each role. So I've got one Active Directory server, one DNS server, nine file servers, for instance. And then for each collection of servers, it also gives us health information. If there's no errors or warnings that relate back to that role, you'll see the tile in a green state. If there's any errors, you'll see the particular drill down area underneath that tile suddenly get highlighted in red to call your attention to it. Now we can add our servers into Server Manager by navigating over to the All Servers node and right clicking and adding servers in. As we add our various servers in, Server Manager will do a basic inventory of those servers to figure out which groups to place that server in based on roles that are installed. We can even create additional groups by going up to the Manage menu in Server Manager and using the Create Server Group choice to create additional groups. So if we had SQL servers in our environment, for instance, and maybe we wanted to create a tile in Server Manager just for our SQL servers to display their health, well, we can create our new group name, and then we can pick the servers that we wish to add into that group. So we can pick one or more servers. We can add these servers in from our server pool that we're already managing in Server Manager, or we can easily add them from Active Directory, from DNS, or from a text file of computer names, so just a flat file. So I'll go ahead and add one of my SQL boxes in, and you'll see that that adds a new tile for that group. And right away, there's a service issue that's being highlighted in red. So you can see how this is calling to my attention on the dashboard, and I'll just stretch my dashboard out a little bit more to make it a little easier to read, that this is an area that might warrant some additional administrative support. So I'll drill into services, and it gives me a uh, detail view 
of the service issues that exist. And on this detail view, it tells me that on this particular server name, this service, the Shell Hardware Detection Service, stopped, and it considers that to be a problem. Well, if I right click on that service, I can immediately take action on it and restart that service. Or if I don't care about this service, you know, maybe I'm not using the Shell Hardware Detection Service in my environment and I don't want to be alerted to problems with that service as being a health issue, I can just filter that service out by changing and saving my filter criteria associated with the services detail view on this tile. So if I scroll down my service list, I can just uncheck that area. If it's not an important service, go ahead and click OK. Now I'm back to a healthy state and that criteria, that filter criteria, has now been saved under the services detail view of this particular tile so that it won't pop up again with health issues around that service if any issues recur again. So I can customize whether it's events or services, performance manager, best practice analysis results. I can customize the particular events, the particular services, the particular issues that I want to filter in or filter out of my criteria for determining the health of my servers in each area. Now, in addition to providing a tile-based summarized view of the health of each server that I've added into Server Manager, I also have the ability then to jump into a detailed view directly of any of those tiles. So if I jumped over to Active Directory or DNS, File or Storage, Hyper-V for my Hyper-V servers or SQL, it would give me a more detailed view. I'm just going to drop over to Hyper-V for instance and up at the top it shows me my various Hyper-V servers. I can resort and regroup by server name, by operating system version or whatnot. So I could have just a flat list, I could have a grouped version. Similarly, I can also add in additional filter criteria to filter this out and save that as a particular search query view of my list of servers. Now based on what I select up above in my top list here, I'll see more detailed information down below under events, under services, under best practice analyzer, under performance and whatnot. If I select just one server, I'll see just that server's warnings and error messages and services issues. If I select all of my servers though, now I'll see a side-by-side -side comparison of all my servers, everything that's going on across all three of those servers that I've selected in this case. And this is a really useful capability because it allows us to look at errors and servers side by side so that if we're seeing common messages across those servers we can do a chronological sort on those messages and be able to determine how that problem is progressing through our servers. It's really a great feature for being able to troubleshoot multi-server network issues. We can see the services side by side and the state of those services that are critical to this role. We can see any best practices analyzer output or we can run the best practices analyzer on all of our servers. And we also have on our performance tab the ability to see performance information side by side on each of these servers. So when we're managing the various roles on our servers, Server Manager gives us some really key information to be able to work with these various roles. Now if we wanted to add new roles onto our server in Server Manager, from the Server Manager Manage menu, we can either add or remove additional roles on, on any of our servers that we've added into Server Manager. So even if they're remote servers or virtual servers, we can add new roles and features. As I step through the Add New Roles and Features wizard, I click on Next a couple times, you'll see the place that we can go to select any of our servers that we wish to add new roles to. So I could add a remote server in the list, I could add my local server in, if I was using virtualization, I could even select a particular virtual hard disk file that I was using as a template for building new Windows Server installations where I could install certain roles and features into that virtual hard disk template. And that way when I use that, as when I copy that and use it to bring up new servers in my domain, they are already starting from a template that has the critical roles and features installed for that server role in my environment. So in my case, I'm just going to step through the process of selecting one of my servers 
from the pool and we'll see a list of roles here we can install any of the various roles uh, for those of you that went through the installer quest you use the add roles and features wizard to add the active directory domain services role in I click next and go over to my features list we'll see all of our features as well um, and so in the features list you'll see a few new features in the list that's where we go to make sure that we've got Windows PowerShell 3.0 installed it's where we can uninstall the graphical management tools and infrastructure and the server graphical shell to convert a full server with GUI experience back to a server core experience it's also where we'd go to add in our wireless LAN service support if we're using Wi-Fi adapters wireless LAN adapters on our study lab servers uh, so those of you that went through the installer quest um, had a chance to, to walk through some of those aspects with server manager as well in addition in server manager you can also customize the tools menu in server manager so the tools menu presents you with a list of all the various administrative tools that are installed on this management server by the way we can also install the remote server admin toolkit uh, which is has a link included in um, the study guide for server manager in the Explorer quest we can install that remote server admin toolkit on any of our Windows 8 admin clients and get these same tools that we can run from our Windows 8 admin workstation now if we wanted to customize this tools list maybe add in additional tools or scripts that we've created in our environment uniquely or just reorganize this list to condense it down to maybe organized into a set of expandable folders we can very easily do that just by dropping into our administrative tools start menu folder so if I navigate over to C program data Microsoft Windows start menu programs administrative tools here's the location that server manager is reading for its tools list if I were to create a new folder reorganize my shortcuts in those folders or create new shortcuts for my own administrative tools the next time I launch server manager and pull down the tools menu it'll reflect any of the changes that I make in this folder so that's just a real brief overview of what's new in server manager in terms of PowerShell 3.0, PowerShell has been significantly enhanced in Windows Server 2012. There's been a tenfold increase in the number of PowerShell commandlets. Over 2,400 commandlets now exist in Windows Server 2012 for supporting pretty much every role and feature that can be put on Windows Server. There's also a new PowerShell integrated scripting environment editor that has some great features for being able to learn PowerShell around IntelliSense. It offers a GUI command pane for completing PowerShell commandlet options and sticking those into our script. We've got snippet support and we've got the ability to search through the script explorer and pull in scripts that other people have created and perhaps published in the script center or on CodePlex or other search sites that we're leveraging for the basis of our own scripts. There's also the ability with the PowerShell web access feature in Server 2012 to install a web interface for PowerShell. So if you're remote and you need to securely browse in to a PowerShell editor to run some scripts, you can now do that using PowerShell web access. In addition, PowerShell 3.0 includes workflow support. Workflow support has a cool feature for IT pros that are administering their environment in that it allows you to build sets of PowerShell script blocks that run in parallel to one another. So if you need to get a lot of stuff done all at the same time, you can build a workflow and then you can use the new for each dash parallel parameter to run a for each loop in parallel for each iteration of that loop. They'll run completely in parallel to one another. And when you deploy those new remote server admin tools on Windows 8, you'll also get the new PowerShell support for supporting these various commandlets on Windows 8 as well. To show you that new integrated scripting environment and give you an idea of how that looks, I'm just going to go ahead and launch the PowerShell integrated scripting environment. 
And when we open it up, there's a few different command panes. There's our scripting pane up on the top for composing our scripts. There's the commands pane that we can open or close from the view menu using the show command add-on pane. We've also got the execution pane down at the bottom. That's the black box that when we run a script or, or a chunk of code, that's where the, uh, the script runs and, and outputs back its results. So we mentioned that IntelliSense support is new for the ISE. So as we start typing, maybe we know that we want to create a new Active Directory user. So we, we know that in PowerShell, perhaps all of the commands that are used for creating stuff begin with new. And we see a bunch of commands that begin with AD. So we start typing that. And you'll notice as I start typing, it starts providing suggestions through the IntelliSense auto completion on what the command option is. So I hit tab, I can um, complete that commandlet name. As I hit space and hit dash, it'll allow me to complete the other parameters that are included in that commandlet. Similarly, if I was trying to perhaps create a new virtual machine using the Hyper-V role, I could start off with new, create a new VM, there's my commandlet, then as I type dash, it will allow me to specify my various parameters. So maybe I want to create that new VM with a name of test01. I want to put it on the Hyper-V host with a computer name of ChemLab HV01. I want to specify a particular path for the VHD. I want to provide a particular path for memory startup bytes, for instance. So I can very quickly and easily compose commandlets and then run them using either the run or run selection buttons up on the PowerShell ISE toolbar. Now, if I'm not comfortable in the scripting pane, I can go ahead and clear that out. And I want to have more of a searchable list of PowerShell commands that I can scroll through and complete using a graphical interface. That's what the commands pane is for. So if I pull down my modules list, I can select a particular module or I can leave it defaulted to all to search and browse through all of the various PowerShell modules. But in my case, maybe I just want to see the commandlets that are associated with Hyper-V. That'll give me a browsable list of just those commandlets that are associated with managing VMs or Hyper-V resources. And I can still search within these within this particular module just by starting to type in my name field. So I started typing new and here's my new VM commandlet. If I wanted to see the details of it, I can click show details. If I wanted to fill out each of those parameters graphically, I can do so. So there's my computer name, there's my VM name. If I wanted to give a particular amount of memory in um, megabytes, I can specify that. If I wanted to give a particular path to my VHD or say that I'm not using my VHD, I can do that. And then I can either run this command or I can simply insert it into my execution window if I wanted to customize it further. Or if I didn't want to insert it into my execution window, maybe I want to copy and paste it up top in my script pane. I can use the copy command and then paste it up top as part of my script. So it gives me some, um, some, some very easy options for working with these PowerShell commands. Now, if I need to see full help on this particular commandlet as I'm working, I can click on the help button. That'll bring me up a, a new dialog box that will have full help on that additional commandlet that I can scroll through. And if there's particular examples that I want to copy and paste into my script pane, I can highlight them, I can copy them, I can paste them side by side right into my script pane and be able to work with uh, those particular items side by side with, um, with, with actually scripting out in the PowerShell editor. So it's, uh, it's nice that we have that, uh, that capability to use the command pane. For PowerShell command language fundamentals, I also have a set of snippets that I can bring up by pressing Control J in my scripting pane. When I press the Control plus J keys, that gives me different blocks of PowerShell code that I can click on and be able to drag in. So if I wanted to see an example of a workflow 
using that new for each parallel capability I can just double click that gives me the for each parallel syntax that I can now complete as part of a new workflow definition so some pretty easy ways of being able to work with PowerShell finally in the add-ons menu I can download for free the Microsoft Script Explorer from the Microsoft Download Center at microsoft.com forward slash downloads and that gives me the ability to search for particular scripts out on the internet that are part of perhaps the TechNet Script Center, the Posh Code Repository, or I can specify that I want to do a Bing search or a local file system search or a network file system search. So if I have a particular network location that um, developers or administrators within my environment are depositing their PowerShell scripts, I can create my own internal repository that I can search across. So I can search, pull back sample scripts, copy and paste them into my PowerShell scripting pane and be able to move forward with leveraging PowerShell. So some pretty cool features for being able to come up to speed quickly in PowerShell 3.0 and for those of you that are new to PowerShell we have some great resources in the Explorer Quests PowerShell study guide for understanding both language fundamentals as well as having a crash course on what's new in PowerShell 3.0 with some really nice hands-on lab activities along the way. So that's it for an introduction to this month's Explorer Quest. When you're ready to begin the Explorer Quest, you can browse out to aka.ms slash early experts explorer. You can start in weeks one and weeks two with configuring group policy in week three with managing servers using server manager. And then in week four, finish out with managing servers with PowerShell. As we had mentioned for each of the study guides in each week, we've included video based lectures, structured study resources that target the particular objectives that each study guide is positioned around as well as hands-on lab exercises to allow you to practice this uh, each of these areas in more detail using either our TechNet virtual lab environment or your own study lab environment that you previously built during the apprentice quest using the dual boot boot VHD capabilities as you go through the Explorer Quest, be sure to post any questions that you encounter out on our LinkedIn community group. Again, you can join that community group at join.earlyexperts.net. I'd recommend that as you're going through the Explorer Quest, you make plans to check in on that LinkedIn group at least on a weekly basis for additional study tips resources, questions, discussions, and also use it as a way of posting your own questions, suggestions, and insight as you're stepping through the Explorer Quest. We've got a very active community out on LinkedIn and lots of IT pros that are more than happy to help with any questions that, that you may have. As you're participating in that LinkedIn community group. There's just a few rules for success. We want to make sure that we create a safe, productive environment for everyone to ask questions and share study tips within. So we want to encourage everyone to participate, share, and collaborate. But there are some specific types of resources that we want to avoid posting on our LinkedIn community group. Specifically, brain dumps, or any exact questions if you've already gone through one of the Windows Server 2012 exams. We want to avoid posting brain dumps or exact questions in our LinkedIn community group because they don't really give us real world knowledge for Windows Server 2012. At most they just teach us the, quest, the valid answers to a particular exam question and it, it really devalues the um, certification if if we're posting exact exam questions out on a community forum. We really want to go through the process of making sure that all of you have real world knowledge that you can use productively for supporting Windows Server 2012 in your environment as well as ultimately passing each of the exams. Brain dumps and sharing of exact exam questions is also prohibited by the Microsoft Learning Non-Disclosure Agreement that each individual accepts when you take a certification exam at one of our ProMetric test sites. So in addition, 
we also want to prevent any holy wars from coming up. So the LinkedIn community group is not the place to discuss whether product X is better than product Y. Um, it's not the place to compare Windows Server 2012 uh, out in the market to other competition or whatnot. We're all here for the same reason. We're all here to gain technical knowledge on Windows Server 2012 and support one another through the study process. And so we want to make sure that the conversations and topics are very much related to studying Windows Server 2012 and helping us all succeed in passing those certification exams. So that's it. When you're ready to begin, you can browse out to earlyexperts.net. If you haven't started the program yet, you can start off at the Apprentice Quest that you'll see right on our right on our first home page, and then progress through the Installer Quest, and then this month's quest, which is the Explorer Quest. I hope you enjoy the Early Experts Knowledge Quests this month, and I look forward to delivering your completion certificate to you when, when you're finished with all of the hands-on lab exercises. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.